Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the On The Record Sports Podcast. My name is Drew King. I'm the sports editor of the San Marcos Daily Record. To my left, we have the one and only Deshaun Hartley. To my right at the far end, we have our podcasting extraordinaire, Jude McLaren. And our very special guest today, we have new Texas State soccer coach, Steve Holman. Coach, thank you so much for coming on. Um, usually, coach, we're at the original Black's Barbecue in San Marcos. We're not there today. <laughs> However, I still got to ask you, what is your go-to barbecue meal? It's probably going to be brisket. Okay. I think, yeah. I'm kind of a brisket kind okay. of guy, but what, what, kind, what kind of size do you like with your brisket? Sides, I would go with mac and cheese, and I think Deshaun just said the mac and cheese was really yes. good there. So, yes. really good. Uh, pretty basic, probably beans, uh, maybe some potato salad. Okay. So. Yeah, good answers, good answers. Uh, <laughs> so, coach, you got named um, the head coach back in early February. Um, just kind of walk us through what the past couple of months have been like, um, settling in and adjusting to this new program. Right, it's been a little bit uh, wild and crazy and chaotic, but a, a very good busy. So I got here I actually on a Tuesday morning, my team at Lamar University, to let them know I was leaving. The afternoon, I had a Zoom call with the current Texas State team. That I back more of to San Marcos, and Wednesday night, I had my first training session with oh, the wow. team. Three days later on Saturday, we had our first spring game, so it was uh, kind of thrown right into it. Gotcha. Yeah. What's uh, some of that kind of like, just having to inform a team that you're leaving a program or that you're not going to be with them anymore? How do you deal with that uh, kind of emotionally, mentally, and all that? Well, it wasn't easy, and it certainly wasn't something I was look, looking forward to, and, and the big part of that was the, the most difficult part about the decision really had a lot to do with them. Mm -hmm. I was very close to the team. It's a team that we built. Uh, that we recruited and we made sure we recruited not just good players but good people and so we had a very good connection and close relationship with with pretty much all the girls on the team and so it was very challenging uh, it, it was pretty emotional and it was kind of a, a, a bittersweet move um, and the bitter part was having to leave the team at Lamar so left a really good team behind. Well, talking about where you just came, when it comes to Texas State, uh, what were some of the things that appealed to you when you were looking at this job, and what were some of the things maybe even about the roster um, as well as the location recruiting-wise that attracted you? Sure. Well, the last thing you said, location. I mean, you know, people outside of Texas kind of look uh, at this and say, why would Steve Holman move from Lamar to Texas State? That's Isn't that a lateral move? And I think anyone that's been to Beaumont and been to San Marcos knows it's not a lateral move. I mean, what a phenomenal place. I've been here in the Hill Country many times just on vacation. And so the place is gorgeous. The campus is amazing. You know, I walk outside my office here and there's this Sewell Park and the San Marcos River. And so I think there's just, I think it's a bit of a gold mine. I, I think that there's lots of potential here to be successful um, in women's soccer. And they've had success in the past and we're looking to bring that back. And obviously with uh, men's basketball winning the conference title and Baseball's top 20 in the country. I mean, big things can happen here. So looking forward to that opportunity. Yeah, Coach, just to rewind a little bit, I read that you used to be a soccer player. Um, and so I wanted to know more about how you got into the sport, um, kind of a, a little bit about your playing career and, and, and what led you into coaching. Yeah, it started from a young age. I was I was seven when I first played soccer. Nowadays, kids are playing at three and four. They didn't have it that young because I'm a little older than most of this generation, definitely older than you guys. But uh, yeah, I grew up playing soccer and I was fortunate to have some success early on and kind of parlayed that into a, a stint at Wake Forest University. We were a you know, top 10 team. We went to the, the NCAA tournament three of my four years, won the ACC title for the first time in, in uh, Wake Forest history. And so just got into soccer and you know, once I graduated, I got into coaching uh, a little bit and knew that I wanted to get back, get back to the game. And, mm -hmm just a, a soccer junkie, passion for soccer, and I was fortunate to land a, a head coaching job at a, at a very young age, and I've been blessed to kind of still still be involved. Yeah, what made you want to get coaching after kind of your playing career? What, what was it about it that drew you in? Yeah, it's really just a matter of, you know, having so much passion and, and love for the game that you, you want to give back and having the opportunity to teach others the game and, and watching them grow and having an impact on, on players' lives is just, something that most people don't get the opportunity to do what's the kind of difference like i ask a lot of coaches this like 
when you're a player versus when you're a coach, you're seeing it from the other side. Yeah. What are some of the things that you're seeing now? Like, oh, my coach might have said that to me. Now I'm telling it to them or some of those things. You're yeah, that, that makes me think about a lot of different things. You <laughs> see it from a completely different perspective, right? If only I knew then what I know now. First of all, as a player, um, I thought I knew a lot. And as I got into coaching, I realized how little I knew. And so just even from a tactical perspective, um, you know, I, I think if, if I were to play now, which, which I still kind of get on the field, tactically I'm a lot more aware. I'm just physically not there. So if you kind of had that awareness. But, you know, some of the things you realize what a coach has to deal with has to deal with players like, like me, right? And so you see it from the other side, and it's, it's, it's completely different. So I think that's why there's value in young players getting into coaching because that helps them become better players. Uh, just another question to follow that up. Do you – like the coaching aspect better than your playing days which mm. one were, which one were better for that you? that's a good one i, I really I'm, <laughs> I'm i'm older and i'm still trying to hang on and play as much soccer as i can until i'm not able to anymore so i really love the game but you know there's obviously positives to to both i'm i'm a competitor so if i'm uh if, if i'm competing and, and doing well then i enjoy that part as well you know, you mentioned that you got an opportunity to coach at a very young age. And when I was yeah. looking into you a little bit, you were studying your master's at Auburn when I you was. got that opportunity, yeah. correct? Can yeah. you just take me, you know, what it was like building that, like starting that program with three weeks <clears throat> to spare, I believe, or six weeks to spare, something that's like right. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was that like for you? And I mean, that's a very unique experience for a first coaching job, starting a program and while you're going to school somewhere. It, it was. So I actually, so I got my undergrad at Wake Forest, as I said, and I got my master's degree from... Auburn University in exercise physiology, and then I started my, my doctorate. So as I was doing my coursework towards my doctorate, um, back in, 19, I guess I'll go ahead and say the year, back in 1993, uh, Auburn started a program, and it was the result of Title IX, which you probably hear that a lot today. So the club team, and most people don't know this, the club team had sued the university to start a Division I women's soccer program for Title IX reasons, and they won. It was, if you look in your history books, hate that I'm part of a history book, but you'll see that that was one of the first kind of episodes of Title IX. And so they, I was kind of right place at the right time working on my doctorate. Um, I applied for the job just thinking, yeah, you know, what the heck, I might as well. And, and they hired me, took a chance, young head coach, um, at the time, youngest division one head coach in the country. So continued to work on my, on my PhD through that season. They hired me as the interim coach. So started the program in six weeks, as you mentioned. When I got hired, we didn't have a team, we didn't have a field, we didn't have equipment, we didn't have a schedule, it was literally from scratch. So once I had that opportunity to go through that season, um, at the end they did a national search and, and I started to look as well and I ended up at um, being named the head coach at Ole Miss. So I knew that's what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So. All right, now, Coach, this is the On the Record podcast, right? So we got to ask you some tough questions. Okay. Oh, um, uh -oh. There's a video that came out on social media today. Oh, boy. Um, it's obviously May the 4th. Um, May the 4th, yeah. Texas State wanted to put out a Star Wars-themed video. That's right. Uh, it looked like one of your assistants came up to you to remind you that it was May the 4th. <laughs> and you kind of just kind of waved your hand at him and the door yeah, shut. Yeah, so, of course. So on the record, Coach, can you confirm – that you are one with the force. Well, you saw it. I mean, that was not a gimmick. That was legit. Um, it was Nathan Stocky. He's a bit of a Star Wars nerd. Um, so yeah, he, he talked me to it. It was his idea, give him full credit, but yeah, thought it was pretty funny. There you go, so. you heard it here first. You heard it here On first. On the record. <laughs> On the record, Nathan Stocky, the nerd. <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> Well, speaking of some of your staff, like Coach Stalky, I know that you had the opportunity to just get that finished up, I believe, in April. Um, what are just your thoughts on your staff overall and kind of the attributes that they bring to the table? Part of me accepting this position was contingent upon me being able to bring my staff, and that consists of Nathan Stock. I know I, I joked around with him just then because I know he's watching. So, uh, I mean, he's a phenomenal goalkeeper coach, uh, just a phenomenal person, and I, I definitely wanted to bring him on board. Uh, Henry Zapata was with me at Lamar for five years. He helped me win four uh, championships, and then he left to Iowa State for a year, and I wanted to bring him back, so I was able to bring him on board. When he left, Hannah Smith took his place at Lamar University, and I was like, I wanted to bring Hannah as well because she's just kind of keeps us all together and completes the, the puzzle there. So 
Um, I, I wanted to find a way to get all, all three of them on board and, and they agreed to it. They created a, a new position so I could make that happen. And so, yeah, I have a, an amazing staff. Was that the director of operations that position? Is, that is, yes. Can you talk about like what that entails for your soccer team? Because I know some people may know what it means for football. Sure, but. sure. Basically, it's a, it's a non-coaching position. Um, she will do a lot of soccer related things. She'll do some administrative things, but a lot of soccer related like video breakdown and video analysis and, and help us recruiting. She's not allowed to recruit off campus, but can recruit on campus and, and break down recruit uh, videos and um, a lot of important information that, that goes into her role there. Gotcha. Yeah. Coach, what was it about um, having the continuity on your staff that was important to you? Well, I, I knew that with this staff, we could build something special here. Um, we've, we've proven that um, at Lamar University. I, I knew what I wanted. I know how we mesh. I know how we work together, and we complement each other extremely well. So, yeah, I, I think it was really important for me, for me to bring them on board. What's it kind of be? What's it like being um, a male coach to female soccer players? Like, what? How do you navigate? You know, oh, I'm yelling at them a little bit, or, or if they're sensitive or anything like that. How do you just navigate that type of? Thing? Yeah, that's a good question, and I've been doing it for 27 years, so it's kind of all I know. I actually, I have a daughter mm -hmm. who's a junior in high school, so I kind of got to learn. But but early on, obviously, I. I I didn't know everything I know now, but there's a huge difference between coaching men, coaching males, and coaching females. And you know, coaching a team of males is like coaching 11 different egos, and coaching a team of females is like coaching 11 different personalities. So <laughs> they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's kind of a good saying to go by. So it's been great to develop relationships. Mm -hmm. They're motivated differently, but. Than, than men are, but even with that said, each individual female is motivated differently. So it's a matter of kind of getting to know them, finding out what makes them work, and and helping improve them in their game, and finding different ways to uh, to bring them to be their best. How much have you gotten to know this <clears throat> team so far since you've been here? Uh, yeah, man, I've been here a couple months, so I've gotten to know them pretty well. We've had, you know, we had individual meetings with everyone. We had small group meetings. Uh, we've kind of done lunch with, with small groups and obviously had the opportunity to, to train them on the field and we had five spring games. Uh, we've also done a lot of different things and hit a bunch of different topics in. We have a, a video uh, theater room, which is really unique. We've got like a 40 seat theater that we can have meetings in. So uh, we have meetings in there about once a week where we cover different topics and kind of get to know them quite a bit. Good. Yeah, I heard you talk about just loving the game and being around it so much. What is the part of soccer that you just fall in love with or that you just see on the field that's like, yep, that's why I like soccer? Well, two things, right? So one, one as a player is just the, you know, the adrenaline rush that you get when, when you're playing and you, know, you have success. And at the same time, you're, you're exercising, you're, you're being healthy, right? So that's, that's one thing. And then from a coaching perspective, just watching, watching people succeed. You know, knowing that what you've done, all the work you put in into to training and developing players and developing them and seeing the, the joy on their face when they have success is, you know, it's like you give someone a present and they open it up and they like are super excited about it. It's that, that feeling you get to where, you know, you just, you get as much joy out of that as they do. So. Well, you know, you've had some time to be here with your team. I mean, what are some of the attributes that you feel like this roster has right now? And then also maybe what are some things that, you know, throughout this off season before the fall, you guys still want to work on a little bit? Yeah, I think this is a very, very, I would probably call a blue collar team, which is a, a, a positive in the sense of they're, they're very hardworking. They're very coachable. They're very open to kind of learning what we want to teach them. And we've, we've made a lot of progress throughout the spring. We were faced with some tough challenges on the field against the likes of you know, the University of Texas and Texas A&M. And between those two games, we made huge strides. We didn't get the result, but um, you know, we talk a lot about the process and becoming better and maximizing our ability as a, as a person and as a team. So yeah, it's just been great to, to see them develop and learn and, and, and want to learn and become better. So it's, it's been a joy to coach them. And, you know, you asked about like the off season. So there's only so much we can do in the off season. Um, we can kind of have conversations, but we're not allowed to coach them or train them. But you know, a, little, a bit more tactics. Um, you know, we have a, a couple 
you know, documents that, that we share with them in terms of learning the game tactically and things that we can share maybe over a Zoom. So just getting them prepared and learning our system and how to be their best in it. Yeah, Coach, you mentioned um, recruiting a little bit earlier. And so I'm curious, what are some of the types of players that you're going to be looking for to, to really build this program up moving forward? Well, we take a four-pronged approach to recruiting. So we look at four things when we're um, trying to decide if this is a part we want on our team. Number one is her work ethic. So that's usually the first thing we identify because we don't want to coach effort. Or we don't want to have to yell at kids to, to work harder. So the key to that is getting kids that work hard. And when we talk to a club coach or a high school coach and, and they say she's the hardest working on the team, then we know we can check that box. So number two is, is she going to add to our team chemistry? So that's it. really, really important that if we want to build the right culture, we have to get the right personalities. And we will say no to a player that is a phenomenal player, but maybe is going to take away from that. So the third thing is, what is her defining quality? Soccer is a a wonderful sport and that you don't necessarily have to be like 6'4 and, and blazing fast and you know all that helps but what is your defining quality are you maybe you're really really good in the air maybe you have a phenomenal left foot maybe you're super fast maybe your work with where your work ethic is your defining quality and then for you know our our goals our staff was brought here to, to win championships so we we look at the team who won it last it's Arkansas State won the regular season South Alabama won the conference tournament and then we say is this a player that's going to help us beat them and if we can check those four boxes, we know that's a player that we want to pursue. How did you come up with that approach? Just over the years, thinking about identifying. We do a lot of analysis on kind of, you know, when you've been doing a lot long enough, you think about your philosophy, you think about your culture, you think about what you want from your players, how you want to recruit, what, you're, what you want your team to look like. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of narrowed it down to those, those four items. Well, yeah. Talking a little bit about philosophy, what's more of your coaching approach do you want to outscore teams or do you want to just completely <clears throat> obviously you want to shut them down but what's yeah. more of your approach to going into the yeah game? well recently it's kind of morphed into let's outscore teams so in 20 <laughs> I think I think back to um, when I was at Lamar and in 2019 we kind of were faced with a situation to where we we had a really thin roster and we're in a game at Abilene Christian um, and we had we had lost the, the the, the Friday before we're playing on a Sunday and we're in a 4-3-3, we're down two goals and we're like, you know what, we gotta go for the win. So we took our two starting center backs, we pushed them in the midfield and we ended up beating them in overtime. And kind of from that, that was the impetus to make us say, you know what, let's let's attack. We had two of the best attackers in the country. And I don't just say that, I, I mean, literally, we had the second and third highest goal scorers in the country. We scored over 70 goals going into the NCAA tournament. We were tied for first with Stanford, who won the national championship. but. The, the downside of that was we our, our back line wasn't that strong, and so we gave up goals. But we were winning games five to three, and you know four to two, and six to four, and I mean we scored 55 goals in conference play. We pretty much shattered every Southland Conference soccer goal scoring record there was. Um, but we didn't have a great more into the fight. You know, other see a game like six five instead of one zero. So we've kind of gone with that. Obviously, we'd like to defend a little better. And, you know, in time, we, uh, we, we will be doing that. We'd prefer 3-0, 4-0 instead of 4-2, but it's a process. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, taking you back to the 90s a little bit again, I just want to go back to some of your other two stops in the SEC at Georgia and Ole Miss. I believe that you helped start those programs as well and build them uh, from the ground up. Um, what were some of the things and the biggest lessons that you took from those two experiences? So from Auburn, I started the program at Ole Miss. I did not start the program at Georgia, but uh, with my success at Ole Miss, um, I ended up at the University of Georgia. Um, but starting that program was, you know, it certainly wasn't easy. It was, it was growing process and we went through struggles the first years. You know, the, our, our first year we played University of Florida and we lost 9-0. And, and that's tough when you're, when you're a competitor and you want to win right away. That makes it very, very difficult. But we knew it wasn't going to happen, you know, in the very first season. But we went 0 and 8, I think, in the SEC my first year, and then the second year, I think we won our first conference game, and and then so that was 95, 96, and by 99 we won the first SEC Western Division title. So you know, four years down the road, five years down the road, we lose in season and being at the bottom of the SEC into a championship season went to the the uh, 
conference tournament final and success. But the lesson learned is is patience and. You know, it's tough because as coaches, you want to win, but you kind of have to think about the long term. And some of the things that coaches might do, for example, is they might take this phenomenal player that has a little bit of baggage just because they want to win. And when you do that as a young coach and you're trying to build, you realize, okay, maybe that wasn't the best decision. And so it's kind of hard to say no to a lot of talent, but the way to think about it is if let's just call her Lisa. If Lisa goes and plays for um, the opposition, she'll beat us once a year. If she plays for me with all her baggage, she'll beat us every day. And so you have to be patient in, in what you do in building a program and know that it, it's gonna take some time. You kind of just described how, you know, you took that Ole Miss team, you know, from a, a winless conference season to, you know, winning the SEC West title at the end of it. I know at Lamar, I believe, in your first year and then the second year was the biggest turnaround in NCAA history, wins-wise. Those big turnarounds are obviously very tough to do. Does that kind of go in with getting the right fit culture-wise? How Like, what are the keys yeah. to, to having turnarounds like that? <clears throat> Yeah, well, the one at Lamar, I mean, it surprised even our staff. I mean, no no one on our staff or on the team or in the country probably thought, okay, you're going to go from in the Southland too. I mean, we took over a team that wasn't talented um, and just didn't know what winning was. They, you know, in, in 2016, my first season, we won one conference game. We won two games total. No one on that team had ever even been to the, the conference tournament. And the next year, we finished first won the conference regular season, went to the conference tournament with the team that had never been there, and then won the conference tournament, went to the NCAAs. Of course, we drew Texas A&M, lucky draw, number five in the country, I think they were, and we lost 1-0 on an own goal, so technically we outscored them. Right. That's what we like to tell people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it was a combination of, it, it wasn't total talentless team. We, we had some players with, with some ability that we had to, to develop, and obviously recruiting played a big part of that. Um, and then developing the mentality and the culture of, hey, you know what, we can, we can win games. And we had to find a, a way to win. We had to really, really coach them. We were fantastic on set pieces in 2017. And, you know, we won pretty much all of the close games. You know, we kind of found the players that could be the margin of victory for us in, in those tight games. And so it was kind of one of those miracle seasons and it resulted in, yeah, biggest turnaround. So it's fun to be a part of. What's usually the biggest challenge in taking over a team for, for a program for the fifth time? Just gaining their trust, uh, teaching them your style, um, getting buy-in from the team, uh, getting them, getting the best out of them and finding out what that's going to take and how they work. And uh, player, player development is something that we put a lot of emphasis on. And so it, it, it just takes time. Yeah, but. And then to follow that up, how rewarding is it to when you when the team starts taking off, when you finally see kind of the fruits of your labor come to fruition? Uh, extremely rewarding. I mean, that's why we do what we do. You know, we, we, we coach and you want to have success. And that's why, you know, an athletic director would hire you because at, at the end of the day, you can have a 4.0 team GPA and, and do all the, uh, you know, extracurricular things and community service. And if you're... 0 and 17, <laughs> you're probably not going to have a job. So, you know, getting getting the W on the field and competing for for championships is, you know, it's what everybody works hard for. And knowing that, you know, we're in a 14 team conference and there's a lot of talented coaches in this conference are all trying to accomplish the same thing. So, you know, when if you can achieve that, it's yeah, you know, you've uh, you know you've arrived and come a long way. I yeah. feel like every game is pretty much a lesson are there games or wins or losses that you've had that taught you more of a lesson than you know some of the other games is there a specific game you can look back on and be like that was the one that taught me a lesson yeah you're right every every game is a lesson and that's one thing we we try to make sure i think a lot of coaches i would say most coaches including myself when i was younger when you lose you spend way more time analyzing and breaking video and going over things. Um, I think one of the keys is to analyze one. Mm -hmm. And so we always kind of look at the, the big picture. We don't always look at the result of the game because as you know, you can play really, really well and you can lose and you can play poorly and win. And so we always look at it as how was our performance? 
So as far as a specific game where I've learned a lesson, I don't know if there was one glowing. You know, sometimes you question yourself as a coach. Did any of you happen to catch the uh, Real Man City Champions yeah, League semifinal today? So, yeah. so uh, I don't want to ruin it for you if you haven't seen it or if you even care. But so it's the uh, second leg of the Champions League semifinal. It's uh, in Madrid. Man City is up two goals with a minute left to go in regulation. And you got Pep Guardiola, one of the greatest coaches of all time. All he has to do is hold a two goal lead for a minute. Real scores, they go into extra time, they score again. They, um, they go into overtime and they score to win it on aggregate by a goal. So that same thing happened to us um, against Sam Houston State. We were up two goals with under five minutes. We gave up two goals in the last five and went into overtime and we lost. And when you get to overtime, they have all the momentum. And then you question yourself as a coach, like, what did you do? What did I do wrong? How can I prevent that? And then you see Pep Guardiola, you know, experience the same thing, and you realize, okay, maybe I'm not that bad, and it, ha it can happen to anyone. But you certainly have a tendency to overevaluate. I think when when you've lost a game, you felt like you should have won, but at the same time, you know, you feel really good when you change your tactics, and you there, there's moments where you feel like you've outcoached the other team. It doesn't happen too often, but. Those are big moments as a, as a coach. Sometimes you just have better players, right? And sometimes you don't have the better players, but you have to do a little bit of coaching. So, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Real Madrid was coming was coming into that game. They won five straight, right? Uh, I think they won think, five straight. Yeah. And Man Man City won like three of their last, their last five or something like that. Yeah, I didn't. Don't ask me why. Yes, I know it. <laughs> Good info. Good info. Well, earlier, you mentioned you know the, a lot of talent coaching. What are just your overall thoughts? Conference, I know you're coming in with some new teams joining. What yeah. are your kind of thoughts on it as a soccer conference? I think it's competitive. You know, the team mentioned Arkansas State and South Alabama, and then the new conference members, mm -hmm. Old Dominions, did extremely well in their conference, and James Madison and Southern Miss won their conference. So, uh, not only the returning teams, the, like the top teams, but you've you've added a lot, a lot of talent from from that have, that have joined the league. So we know it'll be extremely challenging. Yeah, I'm curious, Come, you know, you came in from kind of the SEC high major level. What is kind of the difference in style of play um, between kind of the high major schools and, and, and the Southwinds and the Sun Belts? I don't know that there's as much of a difference in style of play. I think a lot of coaches want to try to play a certain style. Mm. The difference we have, so even at Lamar, when we were at our best and we had an extremely talented team, when we would play teams from the SEC and the Big 12, usually the difference is athleticism and, and speed of play. So, you know, for, for a mid-major, you would love to get like the super fast athletic kid that's phenomenal on the ball, but usually something's gotta give, right? They're super athletic, but maybe not as technical. They're super technical, but they lack a little bit of athleticism. So. You know, I when I got to Lamar, I kind of judged our lineup, like is this a kid I would recruit to Georgia? Is this a kid I would recruit to Ole Miss? And, you know, it's tough to get those kids because you're going up against like A&M and Baylor and mm -hmm. TCU and, you know, a lot of, lot of talent in the area. So I would say at our, at our best, we'd have like six or seven players that I thought could start in the SEC. The problem when we played SEC teams, that they, they'd have 15 of them. So you, we would always, there would always be an area of the field, and soccer is what's termed a, a weak link sport. Um, there's always be an area of the field where we would lose that battle, and ultimately it'd be tough to kind of win those games. Well, I know it's May the 4th, so we got to have some Star Wars <laughs> in here. If there was one thing that you could describe in soccer to be like the force or the thing that's the most powerful or triumphant, what would it be? Oh, sometimes when you're uh, trying to score, and you just can't, you kind of say there's a, a force field in front of their goal, like you just can't get past them. We played against teams like that, they're clearing balls off the line. But what's the most, <laughs> that's a bit of a tricky question. Yes. Um, my assistant coach, Nathan, who's watching right now, probably has an answer in his head, and he's he like, like Steve, would. come on, think of <laughs> Luke and Darth Vader, how are you not getting this? But yeah, he's got something right away. Well, earlier I asked you about, you know, what just attracted you with the location and the university, but just a little bit more specific, what attracted you with the administration that made you comfortable, you know, knowing that you would be able to bring in your own tech staff and, you know, oh, yeah. your autonomy? Oh, yeah. Don Coriel, I mean, easy answer. So 
He, I think, did a lot of research, and for those of you that don't know, that's our athletic director. Um, I think everyone would know that if you're watching, watching this, this. <laughs> right? Um, you think. And he was on and, here. And, and not just on, but like our um, sport oversight, uh, Brian Miller, and then, I mean, our business guy, Brian Dean, like all the, all the administrators I met, and Kelsey Solis and compliance, like they were so phenomenal and so amazing. Obviously, it starts from the top with, with Don, but he showed a lot of confidence in me. Um, and I also did some research on the administration here, and everyone I spoke to was like, oh, I mean, that'd be amazing to work for them or for him. And so it's just like a really, really good fit, super personable guy. And, you know, a lot of times at big universities, the, the AD just kind of has time for the head football coach and, and the basketball coaches, but, but Don's nothing like that. I mean, he, he knows everyone. Um, everyone in the athletic department pretty much and and the student athletes so he's yeah it goes above and beyond yeah coach I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your playing career so tell us walk us through kind of um, your, your days at Wake Forest and, and some of the highlights from your career I mean the first highlight I think about is in 1989 <laughs> there goes the year again uh, <laughs> when we won the ACC championship mm -hmm. I mean it was just we were I can't remember what seed we were, but we're, we're at Duke. I mean, it's the eight of the, not just an eight team tournament, but literally eight of the best teams in the country. In any given year in the ACC, like eight or nine teams are ranked in the top 25. And um, to get past three top 20 opponents, to we beat Duke um, at Duke in the final. We were actually down two goals heading into the, um, the second half and we scored two to tie it up. We ended up in overtime and tied and went into penalty kicks, came down to the last one. It was just one of those moments where the guy who took our fifth kick finished and we just all chased him for like 10 seconds, dogpile, and that was probably the most memorable moment of my college career for sure. Yeah. How have you found that your experience as a former athlete has helped you in your coaching career? Yeah, so it's one thing to coach just by learning from a book or from YouTube. And having played it at a high level, you have the ability to coach nuance. Like you know the intricacies of the game that you can't get from a book or you can't see online or you can't get from just watching soccer. Like you have an understanding of what they're going through, what they're feeling, even kind of the mental side of the game. You know, I know what our players think when they're on the field because I was there, I know the challenges they have. Uh, kind of one example I might use as a, as a midfielder, if you're matched up against the opponent's midfielder and it's the 80th minute and you're tired and their midfielder takes off on a run, you have this little voice inside your head that says, I'm really tired, I don't want to track this player, so I'm going to let them go and hope they don't score. Um, but it's mental challenges like that you can't really read about. And it's, it's little things on the ball and off the ball um, that I think you have the ability to coach having, having played at a higher level. So, Well, what's the helps. skill set that you think that you teach the best to your players? from your playing days out um, there? I, th I think I would consider myself a bit of a tactician. Okay. I, I think I'm pretty good at kind of game time. I, I feel pretty confident in my ability to train teams and prepare them for games. But, you know, a lot of, in soccer, you can't call timeouts like basketball. So you see something wrong, you have to make, you have to, first of all, be super prepared entering the game. Um, but you make adjustments kind of in the flow of the game. You can make substitutions. Um, and then you have a half time to kind of sort things out. So I think I'm pretty good at identifying like strengths and weaknesses and where we're having success and being able to make those adjustments in a game. You mentioned the mental side of the game. We had mm -hmm. Coach Trout, the baseball coach on, and yeah. one of their additions this year was having a mental health coach for their team. How much of an emphasis is mental health just uh, <clears throat> for your team and then also just like other aspects of the mental side of things? How much emphasis do you guys put on that and how do you kind of have conversations about that? Well, it's an absolutely critical part of the game. So soccer, we break down into four pillars, physical, technical, tactical, and psychological. And, you know, most coaches spend 99% of their time on the first three and very little time on, and, and I've been guilty of that when I was a young coach, but more recently, you know, we're talking about two different things, the, the kind of the psychology of soccer and then mental health issues, but addressing the mental side of the game, we actually outsource a company called Soccer Resilience. Um, we started that a year ago, and it talks about like when you're in a game and you're having a mental setback, you're off to a, a bad start. We don't want like one bad pass at the beginning of the game to turn into two, to turn into five, to turn into a bad game. So can you recover from that? Can you recover from a mental setback in a game? But 
you know, especially in the women's game, what you find is a lot of them will, when they evaluate and self-assess after a game, they think about the negative things they did. I mean, I've had players who, you know, a, a right winger who will serve seven phenomenal balls into the box and hit one out of bounds, and so come off the field and go, I can't believe I, I'm, I'm suck. I can't believe I hit that one out of bounds. I'm like, you had seven great crosses, <laughs> like you're gonna make some mistakes, but they have a tendency more to focus on the, on the negatives and that's just kind of how our mind is. It's, it naturally focuses on the negatives because our mind is there to protect us. And so we do spend quite a bit of time on that because it's that important. Yeah, yeah. you, you kind of touched on it. Is that something that you learned kind of early in your coaching career? Is that something you had to grow into? Something I had to grow into. You know, I, I certainly didn't spend as much time on the mental side of the game early on. Um, but I've also been a person that likes to learn. You know, I go to the... Um, the National Soccer Coaches Convention and seminars and I listen to podcasts and try to you know learn from people that with more experience than than I have and that are more educated than me so there's always room to learn and grow. What do you think you've learned most from watching other people do it or from actually doing it yourself in terms of playing the sport too? Just little things I, I, I think you, you kind of pick up I could, I could go out to the local high school and watch you know, the coach run, run a session and I might be able to pick up one, one small thing, but it's a matter of kind of accumulating all those ideas and making them your own. Um, just like when I go to convention and I watch sessions, there's always a few things that I can pick up. And then the other thing is you, um, you kind of tweak your own, you find out what works. You know, there was a time where if we worked say on a, on a corner kick, Right, and we just go over it. We, so we spent a lot of time on set pieces and specifically the day before a game. So we'd go over a, a corner kick the day before a game and then the next day we'd have that same corner kick, I'd call it out, and the player I just taught the day before would make the wrong run and I used to always blame it on her. And then I started to say, okay, well maybe it's not her fault, it's my fault because I'm not being effective. Mm -hmm. So how can I be a better communicator? How can I adjust? So maybe she's a visual learner. Maybe we need to show a video of this. Maybe we, so we started giving handouts. We started doing quizzes on set pieces. So we started kind of adding because I now put, if they're not learning, then I put it back on me as opposed to, oh, she's just never gonna learn. Because there will be a way to learn and be effective. I have to find out what that is. So I put that challenge on myself. This is usually a question that Deshaun asks a lot, but I know there's been a lot of impacts just with the transfer portal on all of college athletics. Just, I know there's so much going on with it, but what are just kind of your overall thoughts on how you have to adjust to the new way of things and just kind of the age of the transfer, <coughs> transfer portal yeah, in college it's, athletics? It's just constantly evolving. There's always something, you know, first it's the transfer portal, then the NIL, and NIL doesn't affect us as much as it does football, um, the other major sports, but Transfer portal has just become now a means of recruiting almost. Uh, I know a lot of coaches and programs are on there daily just kind of seeing who pops up and people can make a living off the portal and now it just gives players the opportunity to, you know, get up and, and leave whenever they want. So, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a one-way street, I think. Um, Cause if we were to release a player, then, then we're the bad people. But if they want to get up and go, then they, they have a free a free pass so um, there's certainly advantages to it for from the player standpoint and from from a coaching standpoint but yeah it's an interesting endeavor that you know it just things continue to change and we have to adapt yeah uh, talking to other coaches um, other college coaches you know one of the things he said was the most important thing in recruiting now is you're not necessarily recruiting other players you're recruiting your own players to stay on the team. Do sure. you agree with that? Sure, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, because if, if, if you're not, then help on the transfer portal, right? So, and, and I think that's the way it should be though. You know, it shouldn't be the threat of losing them is why you want to do things for them. Um, it should always be like that. You should want to have a good relationship with your players. I mean, if, especially if you recruited them and you should care for them and you should treat them um, always the same and not overemphasize it for the fear of losing them. So, but there's certainly some truth to that. How do you kind of spot the difference in what type of learner there are, they are? Like I know teachers are trying to do that too. They just, yeah. you know, hand us tests and quizzes and say, hey, go learn. How did you kind of develop like, okay, this player I can see is like this player that I coach, so she's a visual learner, or this player is a 
has to sit down and actually physically touch it to learn it or do that? How did you kind of learn the, some the, of that? The answer is going to sound really basic. <laughs> Ask them. So we actually will give them our team a questionnaire, and it's some, mm -hmm. It's not something we've always done. It's right. just something that we've kind of learned and, and added. So you know, I, I might yell at you, and you might play better, and I might yell at you, and you might cry and play worse. But I, I'm not going to know that unless you tell me that. Right, so I have to find that out, and I don't want to find that out by yelling at both of you, and then you go cry and you play better. Mm -hmm. You know, I might call you out. Guys are more likely to respond to, "I hey, that's not good enough," and some girls will respond to that, and some girls will, will play worse. So it's really the, the the first step is just asking them and letting them be honest with you, and, and kind of adjusting. So throughout just this episode so far, one of the things I've noticed is your emphasis on relationships. Uh, we've talked to a lot of coaches, whether it's the high school or the college level over just kind of the past three or so years, and yeah. that's really become an emphasis in all sports, sure. it seems like. But when it comes to those relationships and being in a new place, how do you kind of start building, building that trust, as you mentioned? Just naturally, just kind of getting to know them, sitting them, talking to them, interacting. Um, not, nothing forced, just, you know, this is why, um, and Hannah, my, our director of ops, brought this idea to Lamar, is going to lunch in small groups to where, like, they don't feel uncomfortable because it's not a one-on-one, -on -one, but we can talk about anything except for, except soccer, and just kind of get to know them on kind of a natural progression in terms of, you know, how are your classes doing, and if, you know, they can open up and share, and every player is naturally going to have a different relationship with each member on the staff, but you just kind of get to, to know them on a, yeah, just like you would make friends, just like you three became friends, <laughs> yeah. right? Well, you were mentioning classes there, and one of the things that when I was reading in the piece, one of the things that Don Coriel was attracted about, too, about you, was your emphasis on academics. How important, you know, is, I mean, obviously you have to have the grades to stay eligible to play, right, right. but um, what are just kind of your thoughts and your way of putting an emphasis on academics? Well, first of all, we have a really good academic advisor, um, Tori Clark, and so we, and then we, we have a meeting every other week to just make sure we, we stay on top of that, but that's kind of her main role, but we, we certainly make that a point of emphasis, and we're, we're fortunate in that we're in a sport where most of the players, if you look at, you go recruit and you see a team brochure, like everyone's like three, four, three, five, three, seven, four point oh. So, you know, we recruit players with high academic standards, and then it, it's kind of easier to maintain. But we certainly emphasize that. And you know, coming from a school like Wake Forest, that was a, a big emphasis. So, yeah. Coach, I'm curious if there's any pro teams or pro players that you are a big fan of that you follow at all. <laughs> well, I'm. I, I hate to sound like I'm a, I'm a bandwagon type of guy, but Messi's always been like one of one of my favorite players, and you know my favorite player. And as a result, I far, followed Barcelona. And then uh, this will not be bandwagon because I've always been a Man U fan, and they're not doing mm. that well. Sixth in the, the the Prem right now. So, uh, but yeah, just Man U and Barcelona. How did you become a to. Man U fan? Just uh, over the years, um, probably back when when they were successful. I can't remember the initial <laughs> start of of my. Um, my fan uh, base for Man U, but yeah, it's, it's just been a while. It's just watching as a coach or actually being out there as a coach. Does it kind of change your perspective when you're watching games now? Do you like be like, why is he doing that? Like I would have been like, move here, do this, yeah, do this. Does it kind of change? Yeah, yeah, it's tough to kind of take the the coach out of the, the person, right? If I, mm -hmm. I just want to enjoy a game, but you know, if I'm watching a high level game, then it, you naturally kind of do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's a you know, an armchair quarterback at, at some point, right? Even people that don't know the game, but it, it, it's the same for us. Like I'm, I'm watching soccer and mm -hmm. I, I, if tactically something's wrong, I naturally think about it. But Do you think that kind of takes, not the fun out of watching the game, but it, does it kind of put more stress on you because you're thinking about it and you're always working that 24 seven? No, not, not, not really, okay. not really. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can, I just love watching soccer. Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoy it. And at the same time, like like I said, watch Man City and Real, like I watch that like learning. Right. So think, oh, you know, they this is what they do. This is how they drop. This is how they confront players. And this is where kind of they draw their restraining line and things like that. So I will, I'll try to learn from high level games. Mm -hmm. And if I'm watching my, my kids play, I don't say a word. Okay. I just, I just sit back and, you know, all like my friends, my 
kids, friends, parents always think that, like, how tough it is for me to sit there. I'm like, I just want to enjoy. Right. I don't want to coach. I don't want to yell. I don't want to get onto the ref. I just want to just watch my kids play. So. Well, this is kind of similar to Drew's question, but just a little different. Um, who were some of your idols growing up? Maybe whether it was playing wise and also maybe just some mentors that you've had in the coaching realm, <clears throat> people that you've looked up coaching and playing wise in soccer. Yeah, so this is going back to how old I am, but I grew up, I mean, Pele was like the soccer king. So, and when I grew up, there wasn't a whole lot of soccer on TV. So, yeah, I mean, all I knew was was Pele and the stories about him and I would read anything and anytime there was soccer on TV we have so much access to it now but back then there literally occasionally you'd get like a Bundesliga game on a Saturday and it'd be in black and white <laughs> but it was so it was so rare um, and then growing up my dad was actually my coach so yeah and he he's they didn't have YouTube back then but he kind of learned from a book and so I kind of really really looked up to my dad my dad was my my best friend and he was my coach and so you know, I'd probably those are the first two people that come to mind. Um, Coach, we're going to end on this question. Um, I'm just curious what your expectations are going to be for, for this program and what you feel like it's going to take to get the team there. Well, I think the expectation is to compete for, for titles. You know, I, I don't see why it, why it wouldn't be, you know, and that's from the outside and, and from the inside. And what I think it, I think it'll take time. Um, I think we have a good foundation here. It's gonna take a couple of recruiting classes. I think that's one of the things we do pretty well is we can recruit, and I think this is a phenomenal place to recruit too. So we were able to, you know, like I said at the very beginning, people on the outside don't know the difference between Beaumont and San Marcos. And I think if we can get high level, I mean, we had twice, we had the conference player of the year, we had the midfield of the year, we had the forward of the year, we, I mean, we had everything of the year, and we had six or seven all-conference players, like, almost every single year. This team currently doesn't have one all-conference player on it, but I think we have the ability to attract all-conference level players. It's just going to take a little bit of time, so, but we'll get there. Awesome. Well, Coach, thank you so much for coming on sure. with us. Um, if you missed any part of this episode, Jude, tell them where they can find it. You can find it on the at SMDR Sports Twitter page to watch it there. You can also watch it on YouTube and the San Marcos Daily Record Sports Facebook page. And then if you want to listen to the podcast, well, actually, no, you can watch it on Spotify now. So if you listen on Spotify, right. you That's can open it up and watch the podcast there as well now. And then you can also listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Breaker, whatever platform you use. And then if you want to find any of our soccer content coming this fall, you can find it all at sanmarcusrecord.com slash sports. We'll be back next week.